Good morning. <clears throat> it's hard for me to believe, but I've been doing this for 46 years. Um, and some of you who've heard me before are going to say, he's been saying the same things for 46 years. Um, this is a command performance. I'm here because I was told to be here. I'm also told that I must be done absolutely at 9.30 and that I must leave at least 15 minutes for comments, questions, and disagreements. And I'm happy to do so, and I hope I leave more time than that. Um, I see some old friends here, many whom I've taught. And uh, it kind of awes me today that to see people who would actually come back and uh, choose to listen to me after all these years. And then when I leave here at 9.30, I have a class at 10.30. So hopefully it's a different subject. So hopefully I won't be saying the same things. Um, I'd like to talk to you about two separate issues today pertaining to the Fourth Amendment. Um, during World War II, and it may surprise you, I don't remember, um, but there were iconic radio broadcasters um, whose opening lines everyone knew. For example, this is Edward R. Murrow reporting from London. And not so well known was a guy named Gabriel Heater, who used to say, there's good news and there's bad news tonight. And of course, during the war, that was obviously true every single night. Um, what did happen, though, with regard to the Fourth Amendment is usually I come, and anyone who's attended these before knows that I just spend the hour moaning and bitching and groaning, the Supreme Court screwed the country again, and individual rights going down the toilet. And there's plenty of that, and I'll get to that. But there's actually some good news this year, or a hope of good news, um, something that could be a watershed um, decision. And then again, it may not be a watershed decision. But since it's so rare for me to have any opportunity to talk about good news, I'd like to talk about that first. Um, in United States versus Jones, could someone give me a glass of water? I was told there'd be a pitcher and water up here. And I get very dry. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the United States versus Jones, government agents attached an electronic tracking device on the defendant's Jeep Grand Cherokee. The government had sought and had obtained a, war a search warrant for the GPS device, but the warrant had expired um, before the government agents attached it to the car. Um, but the government thought no big deal, it could do so without the warrant because of previous court decisions. Court decisions that held that a person traveling in a car is in plain view. Um, police may follow that person and police may use electronic trackers placed on the car to help them follow it. Um, once the Supreme Court in 1968, oh, I was teaching then, um, abandoned the property analysis for the Fourth Amendment protection, it instead shifted to guaranteed expectations of privacy as the basis for constitutional protection. Fourth Amendment rights were no longer existence, ex, uh, dependent upon 
the existence of a physical trespass by the government. In 1968, it looked like the unmooring of the Fourth Amendment from property rights would lead to an expansion of Fourth Amendment protection. Um, this has not been the case at all. Privacy became a limiting rather than an expanding rubric for Fourth Amendment rights, except for private conversations. The use of privacy to limit Fourth Amendment rights likely has Justices Potter Stewart and John Marshall, Marshall Harlan II spinning in the gra their graves. They were the authors of the majority and principal concurring opinion in United States versus Katz, which adopted privacy as the measuring test for Fourth Amendment protection. Remember, Stewart and Harlan were not liberals. They were kind of the brakes on the Warren court. But both justices, before they retired from the court, expressed concerns about the direction the Berger and then Rehnquist courts developed the constitutional protection of privacy. They developed it in a way that expanded government power by placing many aspects of our lives outside the protection of the Fourth Amendment. Privacy became the threshold concept of Fourth Amendment protection, so when the Supreme Court rules that government conduct does not intrude upon protected privacy interests, that ruling puts the government conduct beyond the reach of the reasonableness command of the Fourth Amendment and thus beyond judicial oversight. Um, another line of Fourth Amendment cases that exempts police or government conduct from judicial oversight is the third party doctrine, which also bears on the Jones case. The third party doctrine provides that there is no protected privacy in, in information provided to a third party. Even though that sharing of information is very limited. Consequently, a police officer may get information from the phone company about whom a subscriber calls and who calls that subscriber without a warrant or without explaining to a judge why the officer wants that information. You obviously realize the implication that the telephone rule has for email communications. Um, telephones became a in terribly important part of our lives, but nowhere, in no way, is it comparable to our proclivity for email communications. And presumably, if the government can get that information about telephone calls, not the content, but the, but the caller and the callee, then presumably that information is available from email communications as well. So everything above the line, to, from, subject. Yes, sir? You might say probably, we just don't know, or there's just been not a case? The Supreme Court has not ruled on this issue. There are lower federal courts which have held that. Okay. Right, so we do know the police are in fact doing that. Oh, for sure. Uh, more than the police government in general. All right. Thank you. Um, another implication of the application of the third party rule applies to information police may seek from banks. We need to share information with our banks to receive banking services. Therefore, the bank knows 
which ven vendors we pay by check, by debit card, or online, and similarly, whose checks we deposit in our accounts. Under the prevailing privacy construct, there is no Fourth Amendment privacy protection left in that information because we've shared it with the bank. Even though it's all high tech now, no one ever looks at it, no one touches it. Let me tell you a quick story. 47 years ago, shortly after I, I was married, um, my wife and I lived in Bloomington, Indiana, and I was practicing law and she was a newspaper reporter and we went into, a, I don't know what it was, a restaurant. And uh, the couple we knew was at an adjoining table and uh, we had known them slightly from when we were in school there. And the woman says to my wife, congratulations. My wife said, congratulations on what? She said, oh, aren't you having a baby? And my wife said, uh, no. And this girl said, oh, well, I work at the bank and I saw your check made out to the OBGYN. <laughs> well, that was small town America. And that's the way banking services used to be. Would go past a teller who would perhaps stamp it and if maybe just stamp it, but also post it. But today it's all done electronically and no one sees it. But nonetheless, by sharing that information with the bank, even though it is for the limited purposes and for a fee, and for which the bank would be liable if it disclosed that information to anyone else, anyone else that is except the government. Consequently, if a government agent or a police officer wants to know to whom we write checks or from whom we receive checks, so long as the inquiry does not violate a statutory prohibition, the government agent does not need a warrant to get that information from the bank. And whether the government inquiry is based upon good reason, bad reason, or no reason, it is not subject to Fourth Amendment oversight because of that sharing. We have no residual protected privacy interest in that information. The government rooting around in our bank account is not a search. Yes, sir. Maybe a little off topic, but why would, if a bank had a privacy obligation to their customer, why would delivering that information to the government not be a violation? Because government agents are very persuasive. All right, and while banks are institutions that might resist that at times, they tend not to. Um, yes, Ann, you might know more about this than the rest of us. Uh, bank customers are protected by the Bank Secrecy Act, I think it's called. Which is not a secrecy act. There are some statutory protections, but the Fourth Amendment offers none. Yes, sir. Okay, don't you think it's kind of quite strange that, say, the federal government has to do a search warrant, and, you know, and there's all this inquiry then. On the other hand, as a private attorney, I can do a Rule 45 subpoena just to take them and get everything far more than the government's ever got. I mean, I did one on a... Well, there... Uh, 
Okay, you, you raise an issue that has much broader implications than that. First, Anne did not say they need a search warrant. She said specifically they don't need a search warrant. Um, you might be able to get everything, although I think the bank may be more likely to resist your request than they would the government's. But this is an issue that I deal with every year when I start teaching criminal procedure. And I talk to students about, you let everything hang out on Facebook or whatever other social network, networking you choose to use. Is it irrelevant for us to talk about privacy with regard to the government? Do you even care anymore? And I'm just the old guy up in the front, you understand. And somehow, and maybe it's because I'm the teacher and they're the student, or maybe it's because I'm still somewhat persuasive. Um, they do seem to come around, don't they, to think that vis-a-vis -vis the government, there's a difference as opposed to people they choose to disclose their most personal information to. Although I do warn them that employers today find a way to check their Facebook sites so that at least law students should know not to put anything on there that they're not going to want a future employer, a prospective employer to see. Richard? Oh, I just was going to mention, I, I, I'm one of your former students, so I always remember that what you would always ask is, uh, you know, how would you feel about the government getting this information? And uh, a typical response from students would be, well, I got nothing to hide. I, I got nothing to hide. And, I, and, and the reaction that you'd have, I would see you just cringe, you know, at, at the front of the, of the classroom. But it's always interesting. I cringe a lot these days. <laughs> but, but it was always interesting if you go around the room and you would say, okay, well, imagine I'm a governmental uh, agent. Let me open up your backpack. Let's go through that briefcase. And suddenly when you personalize it, it's like, well, hey, wait, wait a minute here. Why, why are you getting into that? Yeah, and sometimes I wonder if they wouldn't, if they'd have less objection to a government agent doing it than me doing it in front of their classmates. Um, but you're right. It, it seems to me that if we talk about reasonable expectations of privacy, and I'm really off track now, that how do we determine what is a reasonable expectation of privacy? We try to figure out not what the nine most secluded, protected ivory tower, mm, see, not only professors, justices in the country who drive to work in limousines, never see the rest of us, um, think is what the Constitution protects. I kind of think that the American people honed on suspicion of government might not care so much about the government seeing what's above the line on their email but would be mad as hell to know that the government knows what goes on in their bank accounts. I don't think most people really fully comprehend that, but that's just me. And certainly, you know, the use by stamp on me is, has already passed, so, uh, yes, sir. Sure. States can always impose higher restrictions upon its own police force. It cannot impose higher restrictions on federal authority than the federal statute would. Right, and then we also know, like, for instance, the, uh, I what's so that the Bank Secrecy Act is not a secrecy act. Okay. Federal government then can pass a law that could restrict this 
Yes, Congress could. If Congress could do anything. I understand. Um, and you would think this might be something that would attract the wackos on either end. Um, they come in supposedly suspicious of government. But. Well, for instance, the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine is a judicial doctrine. Is there a statute in any of the 50 states that codifies that? Or is that oh, I, I would not know. There might be. There might be. There is certainly. The, the fruit of the poisonous tree is way under attack these days from courts. And I, I may get to, to a reference to that later on. Let me just tell you about Jones, because it may be good. Um, along comes Jones, which threatens the third person's doctrine. First, Justice Scalia, for five members of the court, rolled back time and said that whatever the privacy doctrine had done, it did not the, eliminate the Fourth Amendment's historical and traditional connection to property interests. Therefore, the Scalia majority said that when the government agents placed the GPS tracking device on the defendant's car, the agents committed a trespass, an illegal trespass because it was attached without authorization of a valid warrant supported by probable cause. Two points here are essential. Scalia, of course, reaches this decision because that was the law in 1791, <laughs> and our notions of protected rights are the same now as they were back then for whatever that's worth. Secondly, that is now the governing law, even though prior Supreme Court decisions seem to have authorized such warrantless government action outside the protection of the Fourth Amendment before Jones. But by itself, the Scalia majority's decision does not provide significant protection because he wrote, Situations involving merely the transmission of electronic signals without trespass would remain subject to the privacy analysis. There he is re referring to tracking of cell phone signals which did not involve the attachment of the device. Cell phone tracking today and in the future makes it unnecessary to attach a tracking device and eliminates, eliminates the trespass argument, instead relying upon the third person doctrine that information is supplied by us to our cell phone providers and is covered by the third person doctrine. And, it, and as though to just cast an arrow at me to make sure that I didn't get off too much on the Jones decision, the United States Court of Appeals, our Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, ruled just last month that the government cell phone tracking by collecting the pinging of a suspected drug lord driving across the southwest of the United States was not a trespass and therefore did not involve a search and was not subject to, um, to the Fourth Amendment oversight. Um, more interesting than Scalia's opinions are the two approaches of Justices Alito and Sotomayor, which hold out hope for reconsideration of the third party rule. Justice Alito, one of the arch conservatives on the court, but for himself and three generally liberal justices, rejected the trespass approach entirely and said the lengthy monitoring that occurred in this case constituted a search under the Fourth Amendment. So what he was saying was it didn't matter whether there was a trespass, it was the monitoring over a 29-day period that constituted an unreasonable search and therefore 
required a warrant. Um, Alito pointed out how technology threatens privacy. And he said, without the new technology, it would have taken gov dozens of government agents to track the defendant for 29 days. He concluded, though, that short-term monitoring of a person's movements on the street accords with expectations of privacy that our society has deemed recognized as reasonable, whether done by smartphone monitoring or an attached GPS. However, he concluded that tracking for four weeks impinges on expectations of privacy and was a search subject to the Fourth Amendment command of reasonableness. He says, the government crossed the line well before the four week line point, but he doesn't tell us when, all right? Um, but it does, it does hope, hold out some hope, although the Sixth Circuit certainly dismissed that possibility. Uh, what the Sixth Circuit seemed to miss was that there was a fifth vote for Justice Alito's, Alito's approach. Just, Justice Sotomayor voted with Scalia so that there would be a majority opinion, but she also wrote separately to say it's time to reconsider the whole third party doctrine. Um, and that's why I find some positive hope in Jones. The third party rule makes it impossible to live in a 21st century society and retain constitutionally protected privacy. We no longer can opt out. We need banks, we need telephones, we need internet service providers. And the third party rule makes all technology the enemy of Fourth Amendment protection. When we think of what is a reasonable expectation of privacy, we should try to project what the American people expect of their constitutional system. I know how difficult that is. We might all be substituting our own notions there, as the Supreme Court does. But as I said earlier, I think a constitutional system founded on distrust of government would find disfavor in the third party rule. Um, remember, by saying that a government intrusion is not a search, it puts all judicial oversight under the Fourth Amendment off the table. All I'm suggesting is it should never be off the table. We should want to know, and a court should want to know, why the government sought the particular information about a particular individual. Once we cripple the third party rule, we can discuss what type of government oversight would be sufficient to guarantee reasonableness and still allow for effective law enforcement. But as I said at the outset, there's a little good news, but a whole lot of bad news. And let me take the remainder of my time to, to talk about the bad news. American states and municipalities have so many minor traffic regulations that every time one of us gets behind the wheel of a car, we are likely to commit multiple violations. <clears throat> 30 years ago, I used to laugh when young police officers, cowboys I thought, attending training programs that were offered at our law school, boasted to me that they could stop every car legally for at least 10 traffic violations. 
I'm not laughing any longer. I've even learned to change how I drive. Um, I stopped, I, I got tired of getting tickets. Um, do you always signal when you move into or from a parking spot at the curb when there is no other traffic in sight? Do you religiously signal lane shifts or turns even when there's not a car near you? When driving on the highway, do you ever kind of drift slightly across the berm line and then right yourself immediately? Have you measured how dark your window tint is lately? The Supreme Court's failure to impose meaningful limitations upon traffic stops has ensured that police have unlimited discretion whom to stop for such violations. The Fourth Amendment command of reasonableness is not triggered until an officer orders a motorist to pull over. Therefore, m police may target a car before the commission of a traffic offense, allowing the officer to follow that car for a reasonable period of time till we get to the Jones issue. And police surveillance of a vehicle does not implicate the Fourth Amendment so long as it occurs unobtrusively and does not limit the defendant's freedom of movement by so doing. Part of surveillance inevitably includes a check of the motorist's license plate. For Fourth Amendment purposes, nothing happens until the police sees the motorists and passengers and the vehicle once the officer activates the overhead light. And we'll all agree, we're all reasonable. Even I've become reasonable over the years. Somewhat. Um, there's an important state interest in maintaining public safety on our streets and highways, and that represents a valid exercise of police power. State and municipal ordinances contain a myriad of regulations to promote highway safety. But a particular violation or the subsequent police discretion to stop the motorist for the violation may not necessarily implicate safety-related regulations. Over, these year, over the years, these regulations have multiplied so rapidly that police officers have multiple opportunities to stop individual motorists when the underlying reason for the stop is not necessarily related to safety, but the officers wish to investigate the motorist for other crimes. This multitude of traffic and equipment offenses allows a police officer to stop almost any motorist. The violation of any traffic regulation empowers an officer to stop the vehicle, ticket, and in some states, not Ohio, even arrest the motorist. Police are physically unable to stop and ticket, let alone arrest, every motorist committing a traffic violation. Instead, police are vested with unlimited discretion when choosing which motorists to stop, when choosing which motorists to warn or issue a ticket, and in some states, when choosing which motorists to ticket or arrest for the same minor traffic offense. So long as there is probable cause for the traffic violation, Courts will not entertain a challenge to the officer's discretion to stop a specific motorist. Even if the decision to stop is admittedly based on race. Think about that, all right? 
That same discretion applies to expanding a traffic stop into an inquiry about other more serious offenses. Consequently, the commission of a minor traffic or equipment offense exposes the motorist to questioning about serious offenses, especially drug offenses. These inquiries often lead to the officer asking for permission to search the vehicle, which may have been the underlying motive for the stop in the first place. Once an officer stops a motorist for a traffic offense, the, the, motor, the officer has discretion to transform that traffic stop into an investigation of other serious crimes without the limiting check of reasonable suspicion or probable cause to limit that inquiry. The only limitation on the investigation of other crimes is that the duration of the stop is subject to the Fourth Amendment reasonableness standard. Courts disagree on the length of time, on what length of time is reasonable, but even a 15 minute traffic stop is long enough for an officer to run a drug dog around the car, to ask the motorist about non-traffic offenses, and to request permission to search the car. Many police routinely ask people stop for non-arrestable traffic violations for permission to search the car, obviously to look for evidence unrelated to the traffic offense. Whether the motorist voluntarily consents to the search will be litigated only if the search leads to the discovery of evidence. Most lead to nothing. Courts determine the voluntariness of the consent without regard to the critical issue of whether the motorist knew that he or she had a right to refuse. My favorite story is of a deputy sheriff in the rural part of Montgomery County who testified, De Deputy Newsom was his name, and Deputy Newsom testified in one case that in one year, he stopped 587 people for traffic violations. And every damned one of them consented to him searching their cars. Now, do you think that those people really thought they could say no? Surely one would have said no, but no one said no. Compounding that, as I pointed out earlier, in some states, police also have discretion to arrest rather than issue a traffic citation, even for a minor traffic offense, further enhancing the officer's status as the unchecked king of the highway. The Supreme Court of the United States has held that an arrest for the most trivial offense does not violate the Fourth Amendment if state law allows it. In states where officers have the discretion to write a ticket or arrest, officers may base that decision upon whether they want to search the motorist or possibly even the car. The law has been so debased that the officer need not articulate a valid legal basis for the search. When the officer's testimony of the incident indicates an absence of lawful justification for the search, the reviewing and appellate courts will uphold the search if there are any other legal grounds on which that search could be justified. 
the message those courts are sending to the police is search the car now. The reviewing court will find a lawful justification later. The protections of the Fourth Amendment on the streets and highways of America have been drastically curtailed. My forthcoming article in the Seattle Law Review, which you've got a copy of and which is previewed in the Law School magazine in brief, traces the debasement of Fourth Amendment protections on the road and how the Fourth Amendment core value of preventing arbitrary police behavior has been marginalized. The Supreme Court has handed down a series of decisions solidifying police discretion and largely eliminating Fourth Amendment oversight of the decision to stop a particular car and the scope of the investigation that follows that stop. My article contends that the existence of a traffic offense should not be the end of the inquiry, but the first step, and that defendants should be able to challenge the reasonableness of that stop even where there is proof of a traffic offense. Similarly, the article contends that the existence of state law authorizing arrests for minor, often trivial offenses should be assessed next in determining the reasonableness of an officer's decision to make a custodial arrest for a minor traffic offense. Police should be required to offer a reasonable explanation for subjecting a defendant stopped for a minor traffic offense to an expanded investigation. Ohio used to get it right. Ohio used to say that a police officer stopping a motorist for a minor traffic matter could not inquire beyond that. Ohio caved since then and followed the rest of the country. Um, we need a new Supreme Court. Yeah, right. Or let's put it this way. We need a new Supreme Court majority to reconsider these decisions that over the past 15 years have stripped the Fourth Amendment of its meaningfulness on the roads and highways of America. In this article, I offer proposals to address the problems I have outlined. Number one, traffic stops should be limited only to those traffic laws that serve actual safety needs. Non-safety related stops should be handled like traffic cameras. Notification of the citation should be sent to the owner of the vehicle without a police stop. More, number two, more importantly, the commission of a minor traffic offense should never be sufficient justification for a custodial arrest, as it's not in Ohio, without a real showing of substantial need for that arrest, which is what the Ohio statute requires, but that's not the case in other states. A legislature's determination to vest discretion in police to arrest or issue citations for every traffic violation is not itself a showing of that need. Three, police should not be allowed to escalate every traffic stop into an inquiry about more serious offenses without a showing of reasonable suspicion pertaining to the more serious offense. And four, Police must offer a credible reason for requesting to search a, mo a minor traffic offender's vehicle. Without such reform, American motorists will continue to be subject to the whims of police officers every time we step foot in our car. Um, I think I'm right on time, so I'm ready for your comments, disagreements, questions. Throwing things? Yes, sir. Uh, so I know 
number of years ago, you authored a book called Know Your Rights. Um, yeah. Is that still applicable, or would you have to do a serious re-edit of that? It would have to be redone. Um, it was published in 1992. It was going, it was distributed by Banks Baldwin, which then was bought by West, and West wasn't interested in non-textbooks. Um, a lot of that book is still relevant. It's way out of print. Um, it would have to be expanded to cover immigration, especially. And there are, I'm sure there are other things that, that are outdated as well. Question. It was a great idea. I thought it was going to send my kids to college. <laughs> Didn't. Um, well, technically, they're not supposed to. Um, under U.S. Supreme Court and Ohio Supreme Court, if there is an objective basis for the stop, meaning a traffic violation, they're not allowed to consider on a motion to suppress the fact that the stop was pretextual and that a reasonable police officer wouldn't have made the same stop. But I'm sure that judges perhaps sometime, not many, I bet, send that message to juries or if they're finding facts themselves are, have greater sus are suspect of the police officer's testimony. But most judges, at least in this county, our former prosecutors, and uh, hew that line. Yes, sir. I wonder, um, you know, the first kind of dismantling of the Fourth Amendment was under our own Terry v. Ohio. Yes. Uh, argued by our own yes. Uh, Stokes, yes. and was the you know first kind of blow to, but the language of Terry, I think, is still in place, which says that. Which didn't exist in that case. But again, I'm, I'm going out to the stop and frisk program in New York City allows literally a mob of 12 police officers to surround a person. Yeah. And the fact that they could even be somewhat stressed that that person could harm them in that environment, and yet it's upheld. And I'm just wondering, how are the police officers getting around the articulable suspicion, which I think that word has a, a meaning in the law, of a potential for harm to them personally? Well, in several ways. Yes, Terry versus Ohio was a terrible decision. But could you imagine living today, 40 years later, where police could not intervene in a suspicious circumstance? I mean, I've come to accept it in that regard. Um, and I was on the losing, I, I was on the ACLU brief in that case. That's how long ago I've been, and, and lost. Um, and of course, Earl Warren put a gloss on it and said, well, we're bringing this practice, which has always existed, under the Constitution. And therefore, the police must have an articulable, factual basis to justify the stop. And then you get to New York City. And let's face it, um, New York City is one of the two most liberal geographical areas in the country. And they have 800,000 Terry stops a year, 85% of which are performed on black and Hispanic young men. And 85% of those are not found to be committing any offense. 
It is a population control device. It's not used just to really freeze a situation and find out if there's a crime occurring, which is what the Warren Court talked about. It is population control on a par with South Africa's apartheid, the, the way it's used in New York, at least. And so there's not one judge in the whole country that would stand up and just say, hey, this is unreasonable, I mean, or at least in New York? I mean, there's not one judge? Well, the nine who count, including four who are supposed to be liberals, um, and one who is supposed to be concerned about justice, one other, additional, They don't. Here's what happened. The government wanted the authority to stop people on less than probable cause. And then for the next 15 years, the government said, well, this isn't even a Terry stop. We shouldn't have to prove reasonable suspicion. This is a consensual encounter. Be still, my heart. Uh, you know? Uh, police can walk up to anyone and say, where are you going? What are you doing? And that's not a stop. So they need not justify that. Just like anyone else could. Of course, if anyone else walks up to someone on the street and asks them that question, that person's going to say, hey, cop! <laughs> Something weird's happening over here. Yes, sir? Um, in the mid-80s, there was a case in Ohio in which the police officer stopped a vehicle and did a search of the vehicle and saw that the, the air conditioning vent was broken flying around and found drugs behind it. Um, and that what was the basis for the search? A traffic stop. A traffic okay. stop. Well, so that was a stop. And the, 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 Supreme, the appellate court said that was an unlawful search. Oh, okay, hooray. <laughs> yes, that would still be the case today and even more so because there is a Supreme Court decision that said that police may not incident to every custodial arrest of an occupant of an automobile automatically search the interior compartment of the automobile. What a shock. And then the, the person who wrote the majority opinion, Justice Stevens, in order to get that fifth majority vote, Stevens always screwed up Fourth Amendment car search issues. Take it from me, one thing you know, our beloved Justice Stevens, said, well, they can search if they have reason to believe evidence of the crime of arrest will be found in the car. What does that mean? Probable cause? Reasonable suspicion? You know, they couldn't go all the way, you know? The, a search incident to arrest exists to prevent harm to the police officer, and to prevent the defendant from destroying evidence. When the defendant is out of the car and handcuffed and can't get back to the car, there's no justification for a search incident to arrest.